me up. <laughs> okay, I'm beginning this podcast in extreme laughter. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone, to Ignite Your Spark. <laughs> I'm your host, Kim Duff Selby, and the reason I'm laughing so hard is because I am interviewing a very, very dear friend, and I'm not going to say the word OLD, because we've known each other since we were old teenagers, like 18, okay, something like that, and my guest today is Ivy Austin, and I will tell you how fabulous she is in a moment, but I want to welcome you, Ivy, (laughs) to a chat with me. Thank you. I can't wait. But we do have to stop laughing. I know it's really going to be hard. Ivy and I met in college and of course we've remained friends. However, Ivy lives in Manhattan and I live in California. So we don't see each other as often as we would like every couple of years. But Ivy is a, well, an incredible person. And I wanted to interview her because she made a major life transition in her late 50s. And I'm all about helping inspire, motivate, help women step outside their comfort zone because there is still magic to be found after 50 and yes, after 60, folks. It is never too late and you are never too old. So the official welcome to Ivy is Ivy was in the theatrical world and actually still is, but she was on Broadway and I saw her in her opening of her show on Broadway. We competed just a little bit about this for um, lead roles at our small university. And she always won, which is really no surprise because she is so talented. She has the most beautiful voice. And I know that because I just saw her at our reunion and she sang and it was still gorgeous. She was in Greece too the movie she oh my gosh for those of you who know she had a recurring role in Garrison Keillor's uh show on PBS uh Prairie Home Companion for many many years and saw her live doing that too she's just so freaking incredible and she's a writer and she was a producer and she's done everything in the theatrical realm and now and now she's a licensed marriage and family therapist. Did I say that right, Ivy? Yes, you did. Thank you. I'm so excited because she went back to school at, yeah, I don't know if you were. 59. 59 people. She reinvented herself and created an entirely new career. And if we can do it, you can too. Anyway, welcome officially. Thank you. And this is this is a great day. Thank you for having me on the show and for that glorious introduction. I hope I can live up to it. <laughs> anyway, yes, I have a lot of stories to tell. Um, and I really if uh, if I can do one thing today is just to help inspire some other women to follow their dreams and uh, or even if they don't know what the next dream is or they haven't put the next dream together yet just to go, to do, to try, put on another hat. You know, it's just like when you go shopping, you try on something else. Let me see how I look in this. Let me see how I look in this. That's what it's all about. Get out there and start changing it up. Absolutely. And if you need motivation, let me do a shameless plug for my program I just launched called How to Ignite Your Spark for Women in Midlife and Beyond. Seven modules. And the link will be below and also on my website because I lead people through exercises if they don't know what their purpose and passion is, because so many of us don't, but for another podcast where I will talk just about that. But Ivy, before we get into talking about you and how you got to this place in life, I would love to ask you, how do you ignite your spark? Uh Aha. Now. Let me tell you, I've listened to a number of your episodes, a number of these, and I know what happens as soon as you ask people, how do you ignite your spark? They go into a panic. So I thought, oh, I am going to come with some answers. So I did think about it. And you know what? It's really hard. Um, And the first thing that came to mind was I swim. Um, And I started swimming about 15 years ago. And that is my, not only my spark 
igniter, but that's my meditation. It's my moment of peace, of realignment. And I, I've been swimming so much over the past years that I even got a, a terrible shoulder injury and I had to, uh, and I wound up having surgery for my rotator cuff and well, you don't need to know about that, but I will say without the swimming, I was a bear. I wasn't able to swim for a year and a half and I felt a personality change. I kept apologizing for my behavior. I didn't feel like myself. Anyway, I've been back in the pool for, I'd say six months, no, maybe a year now. I, it's just, it's just the greatest thing to me. Swimming, I don't come from a, you know, a big swimming background, as you know, athletics were not exactly my thing at Colgate. Um, so that's, that's number one spark igniter. Um, the other thing that I do is, and I happen to see that book on your shelf, Gypsy and Me. Well, I listen to the overture of the original Gypsy as loud as I can take it over. And again, there is something about that overture that just goes through my, my veins and something so exciting happens. Now, okay, this is not for everybody, but this just really floats my boat. And the other thing, this is so goony, but you know, it's the kooky little things that we do that actually get us going. So when, and I think I emailed you about this, if I get up on the wrong side of the bed, which I often do, and I can't get going, I stand in front of the bathroom mirror and I do my little pretend smile exercises, just like this. And I start to crack myself up. And there is something, I don't know if it triggers a chemical reaction when you do, when you fire up those smile muscles. And I know people out there, please don't think this is, you know, I'm completely nuts. This is a wonderful thing. Try it. You will be so surprised. And then I'm smiling. You know, people who listen to this podcast regularly are not going to think that's crazy because I think a lot of woo-woo stuff and a lot of things. It That is, there are studies. When I was going, creating my program, I looked up a lot of studies because people want to know, like, okay, did you just make that stuff up or is that real? No, people, if you change, you know, your turn your frown upside down, <laughs> you will feel better. It's like us. You know, I could, I knew it didn't matter what I felt like today when I woke up because I would be seeing you and laughing and just focusing on something that brings me great joy elevates my mood and doing your little smile exercise in the movie, in the movie, in the mirror is great. If people don't feel authentic when they're saying things like, I am beautiful, I am this, I just try smiling. I love it, Ivy. Thank you for that. So oh, time. Okay, I am curious though, did you replace swimming with anything? Because that's tough, that's a lot. Long... Swimming, well, before that was skiing. I don't, you know, I've learned to do a lot of things later than most people. Um, At first, Ivy grew up in Manhattan. No, in actually in Queens. So let me give you my little, yes, I was, um, I was born in Brooklyn. But the first four or five years of my life, I traveled on the road with my parents. My father was a musician, so I was a road baby. And then we came back home and then we moved to Queens. So that was my second borough. Then I couldn't wait to get out of Queens. So as soon as we graduated from college, I moved to Manhattan. But now just to a little, a slight correction from up the top of the podcast. I don't live in uh, Manhattan anymore. We live up in Riverdale, which is officially Bronx. So I'm on my fourth borough. <laughs> I love it. Anyway, well, question. Anyway, <laughs> that was okay. Yeah. The general Manhattan Big Apple area. And, you know, you were a city girl. Yeah. You were a city girl. Although where you live now doesn't seem so city. It's not so city-ish. It's kind of the best possible thing. Still, it looks like the it is the country, but I'm connected by the subway and the bus and the train. Anyway, so of course, I can't even remember the question because I am indeed 
over 50 and then stop. Okay. So, all right. But I do have to tell you all. So Ivy is this incredibly charismatic, sparkling human who was so different than anyone where we went to college. I mean, I guess I was different too. I would say you were right up there. Your traditional preppies going to school in upstate New York in the cold, Ivy shows up, you know, with the hot pink rug for her freshman dorm room. And just, I loved, everybody loves Ivy. There, There is absolutely not one human except maybe some ex-boyfriend she dumped or something who, <laughs> who don't love Ivy. And I really feel this is important because it is your soul, it is your spirit, it is your spark that shows through. I mean, I literally, there is not one person I know that we went to school with or after who does not revere you and, and know how special you are. And I just think it's important for people to wear these compliments. And even if you aren't Ivy, you have something about you that people love. And I encourage you to wear that. And I didn't know I was going to say that today, but you know, it, it is a gift for me to have Ivy as a friend and have her on the podcast and be connected. And now we're okay. You're fabulous. But, let's but I just want to say that, first of all, an incredible thank you for that. It, that stuff is hard for me to wear. It's I, I accept that I accept your beautiful compliments but I think um, I think a lot of women are trained to be nice and polite and just say, oh, thank you. And, um, you know, it's really not me, but thanks anyway. I, it is difficult for me to accept those huge compliments, but I love them. I certainly do. But or I might believe them for a moment and then it kind of wears off, you know, so it's hard to keep that going from the inside, but I thank you. Well, it is true. And you are remarkable and, and look at what you have accomplished now. And I, we were chatting a little before I started recording that I was reading the AARP magazine, which I don't always That's do. That's what we do now. Yeah. That's what we do. But Diane Lane, there was a feature on her and she was talking about, she's only 59. She's so young but how she will only do roles that are for her age. You know, and I appreciate that. There was something else that I was thinking about her that I wanted to say, but I'm not, I can't remember now. Oh, no. Oh, they asked her, if you had not been an actor, what would you have done? And she said, I would be a therapist. Huh. And I thought that was interesting. So that will transition us into you and becoming a therapist. And it doesn't surprise me. What was your motivation for looking at your life and saying, okay, well, I've done X, Y, and Z in the theatrical world. Now I'm going to be a licensed marriage and family therapist. Well, I hope there's enough time on your podcast for this one. Um, okay. First of all, this has all, excuse me, come as a huge surprise to me that I'm doing this because it wasn't like I had this thing in the back of my mind during my whole, my professional theater career saying, and one day, Ivy, you're going to be a therapist. No, that didn't exist. exist. Unfortunately, um, about, uh, I guess it was like 2012, um, I went through a series of very, very difficult uh, events. I lost my parents very close together, about three months apart. Um, after that, my marriage fell apart. Um, there were also horrendous financial issues. And then I had to move. Um, I had no money. I had to uh, I was the, I have sisters from my mother's first marriage, but I was the only one uh, taking charge of everything. I had to take care of the estate, the whole thing. I mean, it was just, that year was a complete nightmare. Now. Oh, and to mention you had two boys. And I had two sons, one of whom uh, was about to go off to college. And I thought, 
he's he's going to be in great shape. He gets to leave, you know, and then it was going to be my other son and myself alone in a new apartment, you know, just uh, terrible, terrible, terrible. Anyway, uh, now it happens that my ex-husband and I did not go to a lawyer. We went to a mediator and I found this process very interesting, um, a marital, a divorce mediator. And um, uh, it was a very different approach. So it was a combination of, even though mediators are not therapists, he happened to be a therapist as well. And uh, it was just, I learned so much about how you could make a horrible, horrible situation better. And to anybody out there, if you are in the unfortunate position of, you know, where your marriage or, or partnership is breaking up, I recommend mediation wholeheartedly. Um, if you know if the two of you want to just do something in a peaceful way anyway um i went on to meet with him as a therapist after that my son saw saw him and i started thinking this is an interesting thing now all the while my theatrical career was not exactly hopping because um i was over 50 and um i think actually even if i was over 30 in <laughs> In the entertainment industry, it would have been curtains for me anyway. You know, I worked here and there and I was always looking for something and I was working also for producers and I was producing concert events and I was writing and I was doing political satire, all of the above. However, I felt like there was something more that I could do. Anyway, um, I began to look for something else that I could really integrate into my life and I found out, I, I just kind of fast forwarded about another eight to 10 years, but um, I found this marriage and family therapy program at uh, a school near where I live. And I thought, well, oh, wait a second, I have something I can bring to the party here. I've been married. Unfortunately, I've been divorced. Um, I was already in another relationship and that's the person that I'm still with. My kids somehow survived this. Um, and I thought, uh, okay, I might have some skills that I can apply to this field. And so I started two courses at a time as an experiment. Because if I had done, if I had called it anything beyond an experiment, we would not be having this conversation today. And so that, that's how I started. Yeah, and I just want to interject there because that's very important what you said. You started slowly. You started small. You can have a dream and a desire, and sometimes people jump in. I tend to jump in. I get that. But if you don't know, dabbling and just trying is a great first step. Okay, so you took these two classes and you were... Yeah. And by the way, I firmly believe in that baby steps philosophy, because that's also how I got through that the most difficult time in my life. I would reward myself for doing one difficult thing in a day. And then I was done. I would say, good for you. You did it. You took out the bag of garbage. I mean, it was that tough. So anyway, um, and then what I, I just kept going. And I've always been good at school. And I kind of took that, well, maybe I was a little obsessive. Okay. Um, I had, to, then I, I, I don't know where this came from. All of a sudden I had to be an A student, which was not the case, you know, it, you know, in my undergrad education, I just kept going. And what I tried to do was merge my interests with this field, for instance, when I realized I had to write a thesis in this program, which scared the bejesus out of me, I came up with something that involved women in the performing arts. And I did something that had to do with the unique set of stressors that we women in the arts experience and the effects on our vulnerability, physical and emotional um, how we become physically and emotionally compromised. And I did a uh, study, and yes, I proved that, yes, it's true, that it does 
Yes, that all the stressors that these women experience, myself included, do compromise us in many ways. Absolutely. I mean, I, you know, started acting again, sort of, you know, in commercials and things, but the rejection is right. And, and that's got to have an effect on, well, it, I know it has an effect. Unfortunately, it is not something that I am utilizing to pay the bills as I tried to do in my twenties. It just didn't work, but that's got to have a major, major effect on any relationship. You're mm -hmm. in. Absolutely. Yes. Just your, uh, just every time. Well, one of the issues in the performing arts, you know, it, it's not like sports. It's not like swimming. Ah, who's the first one to touch the wall? You win the race. It's not like that. It's subjective. It's people sitting in a room just making a judgment based on things that we are not aware of at all. And it's that. It's the leaving the room and thinking, ugh, you know, just kind of leaving and not knowing and you know if somebody said to me no I really need somebody that can sing a high E flat for this role you know okay I don't do that so um but that's usually not the case so it's that not knowing and yeah the rejection is so wearing yeah. and yet we bounce back I tried to bounce back for many years it got harder once I had children because I had a different sense of self and a different type of value. And I couldn't do a lot of that anymore. Did you focus the rest of your studies and other things that you had to write on experiences in the theatrical world? As many as I could, yeah. There were certain case studies that I had to do. I was working at a clinic during the time. And so there were things where I really had to you know, stick to the syllabus. But if ever I had any wiggle room, I would go to my professor and ask, you know, does this work? And they'd say, absolutely. Yeah, it's great that you have that unique spin on it. It's very important. Do you find that the people coming to you are in the theatrical world or related, or is it a mixture? Right now I have one group in particular. My my current career has, uh, I, it's kind of a four-pronged career. Okay. And one of the places where I, uh, so I do four, four part-time things, I guess, and they all make, I don't know. I don't know. They all come together. Um, I work at the Manhattan School of Music, which is a conservatory on the Upper West Side in New York. And I, I joined the mental health staff there in the spring. This for me is such a joy. Um, it's a very stressful place and I'm dealing with young artists. And um, that to me is so exciting. That ignites my spark. And you've been there, so you were a young artist, so you can really relate to them. And I would imagine that a mental health component at a school such as the Manhattan School of Music is relatively new on their curriculum or in there, or have they always, like when, when you were studying and you went to the high school for the performing arts, and oh. did anybody care about your mental health at that point? <laughs> My mental health? No. No, no, never cared about my mental health. No, but I will say at Manhattan School of Music, they have been doing this for many years. Yes, yes. And um, if anything, their counseling department continues to grow. Demand is very high. And also um, younger people, you know, there's no more stigma. People want therapy. They want counseling. They want to talk about their issues, and there seem to be so many more issues. Yeah, well, I mean, look at social media and and the comparison factor, and I'm not good enough, And but that person, look at them, they're singing on social media, they're fabulous, they must have three million followers, and I don't, and I just wanna play my music. They're, to me, having tried a little bit to be in the theatrical world, it's a lot harder mentally than a lot of other careers. Now, I think that sports psychologists have been around forever. So people always realize that athletes needed that extra boost, but so do people in the performing arts. Oh my goodness. 
and I just joined an organization. This is all new stuff to me, and I'm so excited to get involved. It's the Performing Arts Medicine Association, where there are people that are dedicated. Uh, they dedicated their practices and their expertise to performing artists' lives, oh. which is so great. Yeah. yeah. Just have chills, Ivy. The fact that you were able to take your passions and your past purpose and realign it into giving this gift to those who most need it now. You do those two things. You also work with couples, though. I work with couples. I started a, a private practice as well, and that's called Artful Couples Therapy, which I'm very proud of. And maybe you'll go on the website, Artful Couples Therapy. Um, it's beautiful. First of all, it's beautiful. The art renderings, the images that Ivy has chosen, chosen are so powerful of couples and just from these exquisite artists that you all know. I just wanted to compliment you on that. It's thank you. Well, thank you so much. And it was also Mike, that was also uh, an igniter just to be able to put some of myself on the page to go out there into the world. I mean, that was, that was really a labor of love. And it's funny. Some people say, well, artful, what does that mean? Do you do art therapy? And I said, no, no, I'm the artful one. I'm the one just coming from an artful approach and artful in that I I if I have a musical metaphor that works for you or an artistic metaphor that works for you or we can do something that has to do with the drama and role playing but no I am not an art therapist I'm not a psychodrama you know I'm not a psychodrama expert I am none of those things but I do I can't help the arts just live you know i breathe and live the art so they're they're in every conversation yeah well that's why i would think people who were going through some difficult challenges in their relationships who were involved in the theater would find you especially compelling as a therapist because you've been there done that in more ways than one with the dissolution of your own marriage and you're coming out of it and also having been in the arts. So you are a perfect fit for that. And anybody in the tri-state area or yeah. uh, who might- well, People in New York who need help, I would love to be of service. It's really my, my privilege, my joy. Yeah. Now, when you were younger, did you, because one of the exercises, I know I started a sentence and didn't finish it, but one of the exercises in my program is, what did you want to do when you were eight years old? And explore that. What did you want to do? Did you always want to be an actress? Yes, I wanted to star in a Broadway show. End of story. Okay. You did it. I did it. Yeah, but it didn't go as planned. That's the problem, okay? So, yeah. yeah. You didn't marry I the staying power of that show. You manifested being starring in a Broadway show and you did. It just, you didn't manifest. It didn't run. It didn't run. Okay, but I got there, folks. Um, and uh, yeah, it's so interesting because when I, um, you know, I, I tried to dream again or dream of new dreams, I, I could, there was never anything that matched that in its intensity. And I don't know, I don't know if it's possible to match those childhood dreams, but it's okay. Life is long right. and there's so much room for growth and exploration. So maybe know that nothing will match that dream of being on the Broadway stage and starring in a show or getting a Tony and all of that stuff, but it's okay. It is okay. Also, when you look at what you wanted to do, you can take the essence of that into your life. You're doing the essence of that. You are a star to these young up and coming musicians. You do realize the essence of performing and speaking and sharing and shining is with you today in what you do. So I think that even if that 
incredible passion, but not everybody has that passion at seven or eight. They might just want to be love animals, say, you know, mm -hmm. and I'll say, well, go volunteer at a local pet shelter. It, it can be as simple as that. It doesn't have to be that grand passion, I guess, that we, I mean, I had that. I didn't specify that I wanted to be a star on Broadway stage or screen. I just said, I want to be a star. So ah, and you are. Exactly, in my own mind. There you well, go. aren't we all? Right. <laughs> you're a star to me, right? And, I, and if I'm a star to you, that's so great. Thank you. Well, I think we should all be the star in our own lives and recognize and appreciate and give ourselves kudos for the things that we've accomplished, whether it's being a fabulous grandmother, you're a star in the eyes of a grandchild, which neither of us are at this point. <laughs> Grand well, I am. You're a grandmother? Yes. My husband-like person has a grandchild who is mine as well. Yes. Well, that is special. I don't have that in my life, so I yes. don't know what that's like. But you can imagine what I'm saying. You could be a star in the kitchen. You can be a star anywhere that you want. Yeah. Yeah. For that you. A lot of, but I, I will say that it's. For those of us who've always had very grand dreams, the pressure stays on for the whole our whole life, you know. Um, and and I haven't figured out where that came from necessarily, right? So after that, after I lived that dream, why couldn't I just do something a little more relaxing, a little less stressful, a little, you know? Um, but I don't know. It's there's something about who I am, who you are, I always, I'm always somehow reaching for the stars. And, and I mean, I, I don't know what that means in my current career. I don't know what that is. Who knows where the next 10 years are going to take you. But didn't you want to be, you, you were a bio major, right? I was, but, and you know, there was a time where I actually went back to graduate school for, and took some science courses. And I thought, maybe I will live my dream of being a doctor. I mean, what is I crazy? You know, my children were running around the house. They were like six and nine, you know, mommy, mommy, mommy. I mean, I couldn't keep that together. I tried it for a year, but, um, she tried, you tried. And that is all we have to do. I mean, the universe is asking us to put our foot forward. And if it's meant for us, it'll come to us. You tried, Ivy, you were such a shining example of how I want every woman over 50 to live their lives. And that's trying something new, whether it sticks or not. You stepped outside of your comfort zone of being a mom and the theater world and you decided to try some science and then you know till this stuck this landed you landed where you were meant to be making a difference in couples and families lives right now um you said something that uh it made me think about uh how about comfort zone okay i want to talk about comfort zone and also about saying yes to things out of one's comfort zone um when I went through that very traumatic time in my life, I was so, I, I, I didn't know who I was. I was so uncomfortable in my own skin. Everything I attempted for at least two years, maybe three, was out of my comfort zone. I didn't even know what my comfort zone was anymore. Therefore, I just did a lot of stuff. And I, my, my piece of wisdom, and I'm sure others have already imparted this, say yes, just say yes. Now, if you have no skills in a particular area, do not say yes. But if you have some of the skills and you think you can rejigger them, right? You know, it's like, Jenga, put this one out and take this one out and put it here, right? Like, I know I can be a producer because I, 
you know, I, I, this is what I was thinking. I've been an actor. I've been a singer. I've been a voiceover artist. I have pulled together productions. I, you know, I'm efficient. I can, anyway. So when somebody said, would you like to produce such and such? Uh, of course I had the fear of God. And then I said, yes, of course. But then you learn on your feet and you do it. And the same thing happened with writing and putting together concert series. I said yes, because I knew that I had enough nerve and enough of the skills to get it done. And I, and I did. And so that, that's the piece about saying yes. And the other piece back to comfort zone. Um, I've also found that you can, you can still press on and be okay even when you're not in your comfort zone. It's okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. such wise words, Ivy. I, you have just ignited my spark. It is going to carry me on for the week. Oh, that's so kind. <laughs> Unfortunately, it often takes, you know, painful events to kind of shake you up and get you, you know, but when you do get back on your feet, you're usually stronger for it. And it is, and, and, and those times of living outside of your comfort zone are so powerful because it means you can do anything. I mean, if you can get something done when you're feeling so uncomfortable and so out of place or in pain, think about when the air clears and you're doing it, how joyful it can be. And it will be when you say yes, Say when yes. you say yes, say yes, it, it will be. Ivy, thank you so much for sharing your time with me and my listeners today. If you want to find Ivy, mention the name of your, well, she has her theatrical website, ivyaustin.com, I think. Yes, and the other is Artful Couples Therapy. And um, I realized my, I, I have to work in the jurisdiction of New York State, but if you know anyone who you think, um, you know, who happens to live in New York or surrounding area that you think um, I might be of help to, please send them my way. Uh, it would be a joy. Yeah. And thank you, Tim. You're this just amazing shining star and spark igniter. <laughs> Truly. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it is my pleasure to bring your light to the world, to even more people. So thank you, Ivy. I love you. You're amazing. Thank you all for tuning in, for listening to Ivy and I laugh, reminisce, chat, <laughs> and laugh, laugh, laugh. I hope you all have gained a little motivation to perhaps step outside of your comfort zone and say yes, just say yes, because that's when the magic happens. And we need your light. The world needs your light. And I just want everybody to be happy. That's the Pollyanna in me. So ignite that spark, folks, and shine on. I'll see you next time. Bye.